Unfortunately, the following message by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was recorded before conventional recording tape became available, and it is an example of early recording using paper tape. Unfortunately, due to the passage of time, this has now started to break down, and this will account for the burbling sound you will hear during parts of this recording. It has been restored digitally, and we hope that this slight disturbance will not spoil too much your enjoyment of this historic message. Here's Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I would remind you that in considering the work of the Holy Spirit in the application of redemption, we have arrived at a consideration of conversion, and we have uh, indicated that conversion has two aspects, or there are two elements in conversion. Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Now last week we looked at the subject and the great biblical doctrine of repentance so that now we are to look at the corresponding doctrine of faith. I need not take any time in reminding you of the importance of this particular subject. It is one of which we read right through the Bible from beginning to end. I suppose that there is more said about faith in the Bible than about anything else. Because uh, faith is that by which all the blessings of salvation ultimately come to us. And that is stated in the scripture many times in many places. We are saved by faith. We are sanctified by faith. We walk by faith. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so on. All these blessings come to us through the medium of faith. So that obviously, this is a matter about which we should be quite certain in our minds. And as you read the history of the church throughout the centuries, you will find that uh, there has been much disputation about faith. Obviously so. Because when it's so central, the enemy, the devil, is more likely to attack than in connection with any other article of the faith. And he has done so. And as uh, we all realize, the great Protestant Reformation was in a sense nothing but a rediscovery and a redefinition of this great doctrine of faith. Uh, however, uh, it uh, behoves us to touch only upon uh, the great uh, central principles in connection with this doctrine. We could spend a great deal of time on it, but we mustn't do that. We must hurry on. And therefore, I'm going to call your attention to the most salient features. Faith is, after all, the instrument or the channel by which all salvation that is in Christ Jesus enters into us and we are enabled to appropriate it. It is the thing that links us to the fullness that dwells in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is faith in its essence. Now, I must indicate this, that you will find as you read the Bible that the word faith is used to cover uh, a number of different terms. It has uh, several connotations. Uh, we are confining ourselves in this study to one only, and that is saving faith. Now, there are other uh, uses given to this word faith. Take, for instance, in the first epistle to the Corinthians in the 12th chapter, you will find there a list of the spiritual gifts, gifts of miracles, gifts of healing, and so on, and amongst them, you will find the gift of faith. Now, faith there doesn't mean saving faith. Obviously not. Because the apostle's whole argument in that chapter is that every Christian hasn't every one of these gifts of the Spirit. But some, has one, uh, some have one gift, some have another. And amongst them is this gift of faith. Well, then it can't be saving faith, because every Christian has saving faith. Well, there, you see, faith stands not for saving faith, not for the thing that links us to the Lord Jesus Christ, but to that special ability which God, through the Holy Spirit, gives to certain people to live a life of entire dependence directly upon God the kind of gift that George Muller had, the kind of gift that Hudson Taylor had, gifts given to them by the Holy Spirit in order that they might exercise that particular ministry. George Muller 
was called specifically to exercise that particular ministry. He's known as the man who believed God. In other words, he had in this exceptional way that spiritual gift of faith. Now, we are not, we are not concerned about that tonight. We are interested in saving faith, the faith that links us to Christ and thereby makes us Christian. Again, just to show you one other use of this word faith, you remember the list given in the fifth chapter of the Epistle to the Galatians of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faith. Now, that's not a good translation. That really means the faithfulness. Uh, it, it doesn't mean faith in this saving sense again, because that is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. There it should be faithfulness. And generally you'll find that the context will make that quite uh, plain and clear if you just pay attention to it. We are interested, I say, in saving faith. Now then, the first question is, what is it? What is faith? And incidentally, I believe you can still buy secondhand a book which bears that title, What is Faith? by J. Gresham Machen, M-A-C-H-E-N. And if ever you see it, buy it. Uh, a book published in the 30s of this century, and a very great book indeed, What is Faith? by J. Gresham Machen. Now, let's try and answer that question generally. And here I would start with a negative. I'm anxious to stress the fact that it isn't something natural. Now, you've often heard people say that it is. Uh, I've often heard it. People put it like this to us. They say, faith is a, a natural faculty that every man has. And they say, you're always exercising faith in your life. You couldn't live for a day without exercising faith. These are the illustrations they use. You go by a train from London to Brighton, and immediately you're exercising faith in the engine, and in the engine driver, and in the rails, and in the sleepers, and in the, the odd boats and nuts, and so on. That's the argument you're familiar with. A man goes into an aeroplane. Well, he's exercising faith. Now, I entirely dissent, dissent from that. I entirely disagree with that statement. And I think it's very important that we should disagree with it. Why? Well, for this reason. To start with, I don't call that faith at all for this reason. What a man does when he goes into a train and sits in that train to go from London to Brighton is not the exercise of faith. What is he doing? Well, he is just doing something which is based upon the law of mathematical probability. Now, that's a very vital distinction. In other words, what this man is saying, either consciously or unconsciously to himself, is this. The chances are that this train will go from here to Brighton without an accident. That is the mathematical probability. I know there's an occasional railway accident, but they don't happen every day. They don't happen every time the train runs. The law of mathematical probability tells me that the chances are that probably this train will take me without an accident to Brighton. Now, that's not faith. That's not faith at all. That is simply putting into operation the law of mathematical probability. Or if you don't like it like that, let's put it like this. What that man does as he sits in the train is he is acting on the general experience of men and women who travel in train. He sees others doing the same thing. He knows that they're doing it every day. The experience of mankind teaches us that on the whole, it's a safe thing to go like that on a journey in a train. The general experience of mankind brings us to that. Or if you like, what the man is doing is he is acting upon an argument which is based upon general observation of certain facts. Now, that, I say, is not faith in the biblical sense at all. And it's very important to realize this, because sometimes the appeal is made like this, isn't it? As you trust the train and the engine driver and all the rest of it, why don't you trust the Lord Jesus Christ? You simply have to apply that thing which you're using every day into this matter of your salvation and you'll be saved. Why don't you do it? Well, the answer is that you can't do it. And that is where you see that there must be an essential difference between the two things. No, the faith in the Bible is something quite unique and special. 
You see it to perfection, for instance, in Abraham. We've already had reference to that in that reading at the beginning, and Charles Wesley, holding the theological views that he did, uh, puts it very clearly in that hymn that we've just been singing. You notice how he puts it, Faith in thy power thou seest I have, for thou this faith hast wrought. It's God who's wrought it in him. It's not a natural faculty that he's always had and every man has. It's God who's wrought it. Dead souls, thou callest from their grave and speakest worlds from naught. But listen, in hope against all human hope, self-desperate, I believe. You don't go into a train like that, do you? When you sit in the train, you're not hoping against hope that you're going to arrive at Brighton? Of course not. It's quite the reverse. You know the chances are, I don't know what the figure is, but probably millions to one that you will arrive in Brighton. You're not hoping against hope. But when Abram believed God, he was hoping against hope. He wasn't working on the law of mathematical probability. He was 99, and you remember the age of Sarah. Everything was against it. All human experience was against it. The law of mathematical probability was dead against it. Observations of life all against it, reason against it, hoped against hope. But he became the father of the faithful. Now that's the biblical faith. And how wrong it is, therefore, to think of it and to describe it and to act, ask people to exercise it as if it were some kind of natural faculty which we all have. We haven't. Charles Wesley, I say, there puts it very perfectly when he tells us that it is something that is wrought by God. In other words, that brings me to my second point. What is the origin of faith? And the answer is it is the gift of God. And again, you see the importance of taking doctrines in the right order. How important it is we should have taken regeneration and so on before coming to faith. This again is the gift of God. Now here we come to a controversial point. Take the statement in Ephesians 2.8. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now there are people who say, the, the whole question is, what does that, that mean? By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. What's the that? What's it referred to? There are those who would have us believe that it's a reference to the salvation. But surely it can't be that. If it were that, well then Paul is just repeating himself again. He's guilty of a tautology. He's already said, by grace are he, sa are he saved. And he goes on to say it in the entire paragraph. So if he but repeats it again, what's the object of doing so? No. He's referring there to faith. By grace are he saved, he repeats, he's already said it and elaborated it, comes back to it, by grace are he saved, through faith, and that, the faith as well, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yes, faith is the gift of God, and uh, this, of course, can be proved quite easily by the previous doctrines that we've already considered. I take you back again to the first epistle to the Corinthians and the second chapter and all that we've seen about the natural men to whom the things of God are foolishness or the eighth of Romans where the natural mind is described as being enmity against God. Such a man, of course, cannot exercise faith as we've seen. In other words, the seed of faith is placed in us in regeneration. All the possibilities are put into us in regeneration. And amongst them is this seed of faith that is going to be called into activity by the effectual call. Or let us look at it like this to prove the same point from a different angle. Faith ultimately is governed by what we called a few weeks ago our disposition. It is a man's fundamental disposition that determines whether he has faith or not. Now listen to the author of the epistle to the Hebrews saying that in Hebrews 3.12, he talks about there an evil heart of unbelief. You see, that's it. Faith isn't an intellectual matter only, as we shall see in a moment. It's a man's disposition. If you've got an evil heart, well, then you'll be an unbeliever. 
It's a fundamental disposition in men that determines whether he has faith or not. Or listen to the Lord himself saying it. You'll find it in John 5, 44. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? You people can't believe, says our Lord. Your whole disposition is one. You are seeking honor one from another. And while you do that, you'll never really have faith and you'll never believe. How can you believe? And then he repeats it. Why will he not believe? Same thing again. It's their disposition that is wrong. In, in other words, this is ultimately a moral question. It is something that concerns one's whole moral being. So that we must cease to think of it as a kind of natural faculty that can be turned in the direction of God as in the direction of a railway engine or anything else. No, no. The two things are entirely different. And this is something which is wrought in us as Charles Wesley puts it, by God himself. It is the gift of God. Now then, how exactly does it come into being? What is it that brings it forth? And here is another very important point. And the answer is that it is brought forth by the scripture, by the word of God. It is by the truth that it comes forth. Now there are innumerable proofs of that. Take, for instance, the Great Commission that our Lord gave to his disciples at the end after his resurrection, just as he was bidding them farewell. Go ye, he said, into all the world and teach all nations. Disciple them, if you like, same thing. Teach them. Give them the information. Preach the word to them. Hold the truth before them. That's it. Take the commission given to Paul on the road to Damascus. Our Lord told him that he'd called him. He was going to send him to the people and to the Gentiles. What for? Well, to open their eyes. Same thing again. He was to teach them. He was to show them their bondage to Satan and the terrible fate that was awaiting them. But perhaps the classical passage of all is the 10th chapter of the epistle to the Romans. And let me read to you verses uh, 10 to 17. We needn't go back perhaps quite as far as 10. Oh, yes, let's start at verse 10. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now listen. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And here's the conclusion. So then, faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Now that is the way in which faith comes into being and into operation. It is called forth by the word of God, by the truth, by the gospel, by the message preached. And so Paul exhorts Timothy, preach the word. And it's the same everywhere right through the scriptures. And James 1.18 reminds us in the same way of his own will beget us by the word of truth. It's always by the word. Very well. That enables us now to go on to ask another very important question. What are the elements in faith? Well, what does it consist? We are now ceasing to look at it in general. We are beginning to analyze it in particular. The first thing, obviously, as these quotations have established is, it includes belief. You can't have faith without believing. The very word means that. It means an assent to truth. An assent to the word of God that has been put before us, that has been preached to us, that has been brought to us. Assent to truth. Yes, but you notice that in this 11th of Hebrews, it isn't a mere sort of a vague, general, cursory assent. You notice these use of the word persuaded, 
very important word there because it does bring out the point. These people, he tells us, they died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them. That's in the 13th verse. That's the most important word. In other words, they were convinced of these things. So when I say that faith means belief, it doesn't only mean an awareness of truth or an assent to the truth. It means a firm conviction. We are convinced by it. We are persuaded of it. Yes, but it doesn't stop at that. And this is a most important point. Because there are some people who would define faith as just believing, giving an assent to the truth. I need scarcely point out as I'm hurrying along that all we are saying is of the most vital importance in the whole matter of evangelism. There are people, you see, who specifically teach that. People go to an inquiry room and they're given certain information and they're asked, do you believe that? And they say, yes, all right. They say, you're saved. A sent to truth is regarded by some as being the whole of faith, but it doesn't. Faith also includes an element of trust, an element of confidence, a readiness to commit oneself to it. There it is again in that very 13th verse of that 11th of Hebrews. They died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. There is inevitably in faith an element of trust. And I've come across large numbers of tragedies in the spiritual life because people had stopped at the element of belief only and hadn't realized the vital importance of trust. But it's a part of faith. And indeed, we must go one step further. Faith does include an element of committal. You not only believe these things and trust to them, but you commit yourself. They confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Or as this 10th of Hebrews puts it, they call upon God. They believe it so much, they trust it so much, that they call out upon God. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Belief leads to the calling upon God, the trusting to God, the committing of oneself entirely to him. Now, it's very important to draw this distinction for this reason. There is, you know, such a thing as intellectual assent to truth only. And that is not faith. It is sometimes also called historical faith. And what it means is this. Alas, I've known people who've been in this position. I'm not sure that I have to say, if I were quite honest, that I've been once in that position myself of confusing between historical faith and faith. Historical faith means this. That perhaps because you were brought up in a religious atmosphere and were always taught the Bible when you were young, you went to Sunday school or to some classes and so on, and you've always heard these things preached, you've accepted all this intellectual. Not only that, you may see that it all hangs together. You may see that it's the only reasonable explanation of life and so on. And you accept it all like that intellectually, as a system of truth. But that is not faith, if it stops at that. Because it is possible for a man to do all that, and not really trust himself to it, and not really commit himself to it at all. There have been men, alas, who have been experts on the Bible, but whose lives showed very clearly that they would never had trusted in Christ. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. The history of the church, alas, is strewn with illustrations and examples of this very thing. Men who have accepted it all intellectually, but their hearts have never been engaged. They've never been moved. They've never trusted. They've never committed themselves. So we must be very careful that what we call faith is not merely that kind of historical faith. Now, the old illustration, it's a very good one, and I repeat it because I don't know a better one. You remember the story, don't you, to show the difference between intellectual assent to a proposition and faith? You remember the men who could walk back and forth across a whirlpool on a plank, 
And not only did he walk across, he then got a wheelbarrow and he wheeled it back and forth. And there was a little boy standing by the side of the, of the river and the men said to him, do you think I can go again and come back safely without dropping? Yes, said the little boy, well, jump inside. He's, oh, no, said the boy. Well, that's it. It's quite simple, but it does put it up to a point. There is in faith something beyond this intellectual agreement. There is this trust, this commitment. It isn't merely a matter of belief. Very well, I can emphasize that by putting it in this way. I'll ask another question. What is it in men that is involved in the exercise of faith? What is it in me that comes into operation in my faith? Here again is a most important question. Again, because of that historical faith, and again, because of what the Bible itself describes as temporary faith. You remember the people we referred to last week? The seed uh, drops down and it springs up at once. The people who hear the word and are none and believe it with joy. But they had no root and they withered away later on. And the people in the sixth of Hebrews, there is your temporary faith. So it's very important to ask, what is it in men that is involved in faith? And the answer is, as I've been showing, the whole men. The mind, the heart, and the will. So that faith, you see, is not some sort of intellectual belief you carry with you in a bag. It's something that grips you and the whole of you, not something that you manipulate and bring in and put back when you like. Here are there two great texts. The first is, again, Romans six seventeen. Ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart the form of sound doctrine delivered unto you. The mind, therefore, comes first. And it must be, if it is truth that calls forth faith, it must be something that is addressed primarily to the mind. Now, the Roman Catholics don't like that, and they dispute that. The Roman Catholics say that the ordinary Christian uh, does not understand the faith and the truth that he believes. The church alone can do that, they say. So all they say a man has got to do to become a Christian is to trust himself to the church. You see the importance of definitions? The Roman Catholic doctrine says that the ordinary believer cannot understand what he believes in any sense. He can simply give himself and trust to the church. His mind as such is not involved. So we have to assert that the mind is involved as over against the Roman Catholics. Yes, but there was a man called Sandyman. Sandyman, S-A-N-D-E-M-A-N, who did great havoc in the church towards the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the last century. And he still has some followers, but alas, there are still more unconscious Sandymanians. He taught this. He said, faith only touches a man's intellect. Nothing else at all. And he misused that uh, tenth of Romans. He said, all you've got to say is this. Yes, I believe those things, and all is well. Your mere statement saves you. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, thou art saved. That was his teaching. And he persuaded many people that it was right, and you see to what it led to. They didn't worry about their feelings at all. They didn't worry about their heart. They didn't worry about their wills. It was merely a matter of intellect. And there were many who were held and led into bondage by that teaching. So over against Sandyman, we say, yes, Faith is something that involves the mind and the intellect, but it doesn't stop at that. It also involves the heart. And it must do so. Here I turn to the Apostle Peter, first epistle, second chapter, seventh verse. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. You notice the therefore? Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. You can't believe in him without being moved by him. There is no value in what you call belief unless it leads to love. If you don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got nothing but an intellectual assent to propositions concerning him. It follows as the night follows the day, says Peter, that if you really believe in him, he's precious to you and you love him. And it's obviously the case. 
If a man really does know the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him, he is bound to be moved by that. His affections must be engaged. You may be surprised at my saying this, but I hear so many people today glorying in the fact that there's uh, not much emotion about certain evangelisms. My friend, there should be emotion in evangelism. It shouldn't only be emotion. But if there isn't emotion, there's something wrong. Your heart should be moved. And a man shouldn't come without tears in, of repentance and without tears of joy. If you're not moved by your belief, it isn't faith. We must always denounce emotionalism. But God forbid that we should ever leave, leave out emotion. But you'll have a true, grand, healthy, invigorating emotion. And in turn, the will is engaged. Faith without works is dead. Well, there's no doubt about it, my friend. It's no use here saying you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ if you're still living a worldly life. That's what it comes to. I'm not interested in what experiences people may give. If they're still living a worldly life and are worldly people, there is no point in their claiming to have faith and to have belief. Faith without works is dead. It isn't faith. The body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Ye that love the Lord, says the psalmist, hate evil. You can't love the Lord without hating evil. It's bound to happen. And you leave it and you forsake it and you turn away from it. Look at David doing it in Psalm 51. Look at him doing it in Psalm 139. Look at it everywhere in the Bible. And these men in the 11th of Hebrews, when Abraham believed that word, he left his country. He didn't know where he was going. He left that and he went, not knowing whither he went. Faith acts. The will is always involved. And if your will hasn't been involved, it matters not that you say, Ah, oh, yes, I believe that. I've accepted it. In other words, my friend, the thing that needs to be emphasized today is that faith is not a sort of believism. I think it's one of the greatest dangers in most countries at the present time to regard a kind of believism as faith. And in that believism, you see, the heart isn't involved and the will isn't engaged. But in faith, the whole man is engaged. Christ saves the whole man and there is no part left out. So you see that corresponding to the belief and the trust and the committal is the intellect and the heart and the will. Very well. There is our essential definition of faith. Now there are certain problems left. And I've got to deal with them because they're so often raised in discussions and because people so frequently ask questions about them. Let us look at some of these problems. First of all, what is the relationship between faith and reason? Faith and reason. The best answer I can give is this, is to say that faith is not a matter of reason. You know there are people who are teaching that today. There's been a very popular religious writer, he's not so popular now as he was until three years ago, but his popularity began about 14 years ago. The discerning will know to whom I'm referring. Who doesn't hesitate to say that if a man reasons truly, he is bound to become a Christian. He can reason himself into Christianity. But that is thoroughly unscriptural. He cannot. It isn't a matter of reason. Because the natural man, man's reason is fallen as well as the rest of it. He's incapable of that. Not only that, there are supernatural and miraculous elements in faith which reason cannot attain unto. So it isn't entirely a matter of reason. Indeed, I would quote again to you the great statement of the great Blaise Pascal, perhaps the greatest mathematician that the world has ever known. He said the supreme achievement of reason is to teach us that there is an end to reason. It's a great statement that. That man had an evangelical conversion, unlike the modern writer to whom I've referred, who says he has not had an evangelical conversion. But Pascal had an evangelical conversion. And that is what he said, the supreme achievement of faith is to bring us to the realization that there is a limit to faith. In other words, what's it mean? Well, faith is not mere reason. 
But that, on the other hand, it isn't contrary to reason. It isn't unreasonable. It isn't irrational. That's the charge that's brought against us. Oh, they say, but what you are teaching is a kind of irrationality. You say it isn't a matter of reason. Well, very well, then, is it opposed to reason? No, it isn't. It isn't reason. It isn't contra-reason. What is it, then? Supra-reason. Supra. It means this, if you like. That our reason brings us to this point when we realize that reason is not enough. And there we have nothing to do but to submit ourselves to this revelation. And that is faith. Faith is accepting this revelation. I like to think of it more and more like this. Faith means that I deliberately shut myself down to this book. I refuse to philosophize. I refuse to ask certain questions. People are always asking them. They want to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. You can't. You've just got to accept it. You'll never understand it. Your mind and reason can't grasp it. It's too great. It's too divine. It's too eternal. So, you see, you accept it. And you stop asking questions. One of the best uh, signs of the real birth of faith in people is that they stop asking certain questions. Think of faith more like that, it'll help you. You shut yourself entirely to this book. You come to it as a little child and you accept it. And then you begin to find that it's most reasonable. Reason couldn't bring you into it, but once you're in it, you'll find it's most reasonable. It all hangs together. It's a great composite whole. There's the one message running right through. The parts are all there. They all fit together like a perfect mosaic. It's the most reasonable thing in the world, and yet reason will never bring you into it. Faith brings you into it. And then you see the great reasonableness of it all. For Christ is not only the power of God, he is the wisdom of God. And when you're in it, you see that this alone is wisdom. And how everything else would be unfair and unreasonable. Oh, I've put it like this so many times from this pulpit. Let me say it again. If faith were a matter of reason, well then only people with great intellects could be Christians. But on the other hand, you see, faith is not unreasonable because if that were so, no man with intellect would be a Christian either. But the, because it is what it is, it puts us all on the same level. It is this revelation which we accept and then we proceed to understand. Very well, that's the relationship between faith and reason. What about faith and knowledge? This again is the most important point. The relationship between faith and knowledge. Now, here, let me put it like this. There must be an element of knowledge in faith. Because faith is something that comes into being as the result of the operation of truth. So that it follows of necessity, doesn't it, that we must know what we believe? If the first element in faith is belief. And if it is belief of the truth, we must know what we believe. So Peter exhorts the Christians in this way. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready at all times to give a reason that is in you with meekness. Very well then, so that in faith there is of necessity an element of knowledge. Yes, but let me put it like this again. There is a great difference between apprehending and comprehending. Comprehending means that you can span a thing, that your mind can go round it. Now then, the element of knowledge in faith is not the element of comprehension, but it must of necessity be the element of apprehension. Now, in other words, if a man comes to me and I say to him, well, what are you? He says, well, I believe, I have faith. I have a right to ask him, well, what do you believe? You always have a right to ask a Christian or one who claims to be a Christian what he or she believes. And the Christian should be able to answer the question. Because as again that great passage in the 10th of Romans puts it, how shall they believe in him whom they don't know, and how shall they know unless like somebody tells them, and so on and so forth. So he works out, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So there, there is 
this element of knowledge and of understanding in faith, it's apprehension rather than comprehension. And that is why all these epistles go on to appeal to us to grow in knowledge and to have an increasing understanding. All their efforts were to make these people understand more and more, and not simply to feel more and more and to be entertained more and more, but to grow in an understanding of the truth so that they know more today than they did a year ago. They're not still living on that old experience. They understand it more, that your knowledge may grow, that your love may grow even in understanding. That's the appeal of the, of the epistle. Well, then, someone may ask, well, what is it that we are to understand? What is it that we are to know? Now, this is a great question. Let me give you a definition at this point. Some people may ask, well, how are you standing there to tell us that we are not Christians unless we understand the entire gamut of the Christian faith and unless we are experts on every single detail and every doctrine? Are you saying that a man who can't really give a comprehensive account of the whole of Christian theology is not a Christian? No, I'm not. But I am saying this, that there are certain truths which are absolutely essential and vital to the integrity of the gospel. There are other truths which are not essential to the integrity of the gospel, but they are essential to the symmetry and the perfection of the gospel. May I explain and expand what that means? I am saying that there is a certain irreducible minimum, and that we must contend for that. I am also saying that there are other doctrines and other aspects of the faith which are not absolutely essential to salvation, but they are essential to a complete, fully orbed, symmetrical, whole conception of the salvation. In other words, there are certain doctrines that a man must believe. There are others about which we are doubtful and about which there may be legitimate disagreement. Take it like that. Certain truths essential to the integrity, to the very being of faith. Others which are essential only if you are to have a grand, symmetrical, balanced, organized faith and expression of it. Now, what are these that are essential? Well, a man must believe in God. He must believe about the character of God. If a man doesn't believe that God is holy, he's not a Christian. If he doesn't believe that God is just and righteous, he's not a Christian. You see, in addition to believing in the love of God, he must believe in these other attributes that we considered about a year ago. The essential biblical revelation about this holy, righteous God who is the judge of the universe. That's essential. It is equally essential that we should believe in our sinful and lost condition. I'm not prepared to argue about that. That's absolute. And if a man doesn't know what a sinner is and that he's a sinner and has repented, he's not a Christian. He can't be. There's no value in his saying he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. For what is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Unless it is to see this essential. That he is the Savior and the Redeemer and the only one. But what do I need to be saved for? And that is the guilt of my sin in the presence of this holy God. So I must be clear about the doctrine of sin and my lost estate and my helplessness. And then the person and the work of Christ. I suppose the essentials are given by the Apostle Paul himself in the first epistle to the Corinthians in the 15th chapter and the first six verses or so. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which was also delivered unto me, what? How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That's the first thing. The person and what he's done, the priestly work, the mediatorial work, the atonement. My friends, I don't argue about this. I know I'm described as narrow. But if a man doesn't see that he's saved only by the blood of Christ, well, think what you like of me. I can't see that such a man can be a Christian. It's a sin. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He placarded his death 
to the Galatians, it was always at the center. This is not a matter to be argued about. This doesn't belong to the symmetry of faith. This belongs to the integrity of faith. And likewise, some aspects of this great doctrine of the person and work of the Holy Spirit that we are engaged upon at the present time. If you don't believe in regeneration, if you don't see its utter absolute necessity, I don't see you have any right to regard yourself as a Christian. If a man doesn't see that he's so lost, that nothing but his receiving new life from God can reconcile him and take him to heaven, I say such a man is lacking at a vital point and something that is integral and belongs to the very integrity of faith. There are probably others. For myself, I'm content with them. But those, I say, are absolute necessity. And as we are discussing the relationship between faith and knowledge, I would say that you have a right to insist upon the presence of those things before you're prepared to tell a person, yes, you've got faith. Faith isn't a vague feeling. Faith isn't a vague desire to have certain blessings from Christ. Faith is a belief of this gospel, this word of God, this message, this thing that these apostles were preaching, the thing they write about. And it is an acceptance, a belief of that, an assent to that, persuasion of that, that moves me and makes me do something. That's faith. And I must know what I believe and whom I believe and what I believe concerning him. And those are the things that seem to me to be the irreducible minimum, the bare essential, the things that belong to the very integrity of faith. Well, our time has more than gone, I apologize. I still have left to consider the relationship between faith and assurance, and God willing, we'll proceed to consider that next Friday evening.